Okay, we're now recording. This is uh, the, uh, you, the DNA workshop using Charting Companion. Uh, well, let me just start by sharing the screen. Uh, one thing in the Charting Companion, especially if you're brand new to this, uh, it's, it's in the announcements or also here in the guides. So either one of these. There, there is a, well, Progeny Genealogy has a, an official YouTube channel, but the one for me, this unofficial, this is where all the classes, the Q and A's, these workshops, and there's what, where this one will wind up. So if you go here, um, you can see all the videos. There, there's Charting Companion and Family Book Creator. Um, but yeah, it's like here's just like an over. No, we don't need a plan. Here's like just the overview. Let me minimize this down. Here's my walkthrough of how I download my match data, add it to the tree, and then likewise using the DNA simulator. Uh, and then there's, yeah, then here's like the class on the DNA matrix and the simulator class. So it's like, I'll be going through some of this stuff only probably not quite as in detail um, as these did. Cause ba basically I'm kind of go going through the basics and then just leave it open for quite, leave a lot more time open for questions. So, um, so I'm using the the Windows version. Are there any Mac users right now? Are any of you Mac users? No. No. Okay. Yeah, we had some Mac users. No. Uh, We had some Mac users uh, morning session. So there, there's some minor, very minor differences, but um, well, if you've seen any of my videos, you'll probably be familiar with Clarence Benjamin Hall. He's my great grandfather. And um, for, for doing the DNA, you have to get a match file and then you have to put identifiers in your tree to the uh, put identifiers in the tree to link um, your P, uh, to link people in your tree to people in your match files. So I'm going to just look up at like one of these uh, from Ancestry. I use a tool called DNA Match Manager from Heirloom Software. Heirloom Software is no more, but I still have. The install file, um, as a matter of fact, if anyone needs it, uh, da, da, da. I'm going to, uh, let me see, where's, Oh, I gotta stop the share for a second. I put a link to put in the chat. You can download it if you want. Do I raise my hand if I want to ask a question? Uh, you, just talk. Do do this, John? Okay. I want those little blue boxes. Show me how to get those little blue boxes. Blue boxes I just, for I I just saw on your tree. Oh, oh, for these. Yeah, this is a filter in uh, in Family Tree Maker, you know, so basically it's just th this DNA kit back. This is what, what I add. You can use either um, D DNA markers. This is the built-in fact. You can use this fact type. But I didn't... Can... I didn't get the little blue square box. Yeah, well, I'm getting there. Just oh, okay, sorry. Okay, I'll shut up now.
you have to use one of these two fact types. In DNA Kit, this is a custom fact type. Uh, I use DNA Kit just because sometimes I use Roots Magic. And they've got a DNA markers, but they use it for something completely different. So if you if you're a Roots Magic user, you can't use the DNA markers fact. You have to create a DNA kit fact. So so if I say DNA kit and you want to use DNA markers for, for all intents and purposes, and you're not a Roots Magic user, then you know you can use them interchangeably. So I create a filter, you know, where it's like, okay, if DNA kit, any data, if it exists. So if anyone's got this DNA kit fact, it puts them in this list. And then I save it. So here I've got 342 people. Excuse me, that, John. Yeah. Or show us your screen. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I stopped. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so here I uh, created a filter and I just did a filter in and basically I selected all facts then this DNA kit fact for any data and it exists. And then, so here in this tree, I've identified 342 people that have taken DNA tests. And then I save it. And then uh, under manage filters, then here, then see I assign this color to this filter. So that's how, and so now if I add a DNA kit fact to anyone, you know, I'll just put in some gobbledygook, it creates that fact then it will automatically color code that person. So, okay, that person's got a DNA. Likewise, to get rid of it, then it will repeat. If you're using like Family Tree Maker 2017, the filters do not auto update. So you'll have to like periodically just- Update it. Yeah, you gotta like delete, delete this filter and then recreate it. Okay, but I'm talking about the little blue box, the blue square box. No. Oh, these yeah. right yeah. here, like to Ruben? Yes. Oh, that's a family search. That's a family search hint. It, it oh, basically, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, th this is one where they they think, okay, I know who this person is on family search and you and okay. can match them up. Okay, I'm not hooked up to Family Search, so okay. Yeah, well, if you're not hooked up to Family Search, you'll never get those blue boxes. All right, great, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. So, John, this is Cindy. What information are you putting in that description field? Okay, the... right now, all all I'm putting in is this. Uh, what, what links up to the people in the match file? So, like. Uh, this is how like ancestry knows me. This is how my heritage. This is how Jedcom or Jedmatch knows me. I've got two kits on Jedmatch. So how did you get that information from ancestry? Okay, from ancestry. Uh, let me just go here. Well, if you download your match file, that's one way. But I'll I'll show you this other way because this is more convenient. Um. Let me just go into my matches here. Okay, so this is my mother right here. Okay. When I hover, now if you look down on the bottom bar, it, it gives this URL address. You see, see I'll move it off, put it on. Yep. So you can see that URL. So here it says like compare, and then it's this number 31cc blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. That number is me. That's how Ancestry knows me. And then with, then the C517B, blah, blah, blah. That's my mother's. So that's how Ancestry knows my mom. And this is my sister. See, the compare still says that 31CC, but she's 6EC13675. Where is that? That makes sense. Where is that showing, John? 
uh, on the bottom of the screen. Oh, I can't see that. It's, um, well, there's another way is like you can write up and copy the link location. Oh. Here, let me just put it up here. Here, here's what the URL looked like. Okay. So I, I'm just so we can see it all. I'm going to just delete the first part. So this, so this number is me or the test taker, and this is who you, the the ID for who you match with. So it's last okay. part. And then likewise now when you download the match file and like I say, use that DNA match manager, you will get a file similar to this. Um, so here's under this ancestor test ID. See this number is always is all the same. This is my number right here. And this is the match number for, you know, my mom, my sister, sister, brother, niece, niece, uncle, aunt. Uh, that's my dad's first cousin. That's my grand aunt. That's first cousin. That's the uh, first cousin of my dad. That's the first cousin. This is the first person who I do not know who fits into our tree. <laughs> but anyway, so you can just copy and paste it. So like for me, I can just copy that 31C and I just go here and paste it. And then in Family Tree Maker, you can customize this view. See, I add this DNA kit pack. And so I can just copy and paste it. So if, so if I find, oh, you know, like, um, cousin of mine, check it, you know, like, uh, James or something, you know, I could just put, paste that value there. I'm not because that, yeah, that James, that's fourth cousin. I don't even know that person, but um, anyway. And how did you get that xlcs.csv file? This is with DNA Match Manager. Um, let me. Yeah, that's this file right here. There's one other that program. Is the drop drop box you sent us. Yeah, that's in the chat. Okay. Because you'll go into sites. I I only use it for GEDmatch and Ancestry because my heritage, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA. You can direct you can directly download your matches. If you have the CSV, um, if you have the CSV. Well, this creates the CSV file. And for whatever reason, I usually don't have good luck selecting the United States. I usually have better luck selecting Canada. Um, and your same login credential works for all of these. But you go to log in and then when you download, you can set the minimum CMs. See, I've got like a lot of tests, 30 kits and I download them every month. As a matter of fact, I just did them so it, takes a while. Um, so, and you can like just select if you only want a couple of them or maybe say someone just brand new. As a matter of fact, I just did one for, um, yeah, the screen's probably not too short, but a second cousin of mine agreed to share her results with me. So it's like, cool, I downloaded her match. <laughs> um, but then once you do that, then you will get a file. You hit start download and it will start downloading. For me, it takes about 14 hours to download those. So, I mean, it's not quick. If it's just one, you know, it's maybe 20 minutes, depending upon how many matches they've got. Uh, and when I save it, I always save them as the same file name. Like it'll normally come with this name, like match manager export, and then we'll have a date and time. So for GEDmatch, I just haven't replaced this one. Uh, for me, with 30 kits to download, it sometimes will error on some. 
So you'll have to go back and re-download those. So I've got a little script that just splits them out for me. Uh, if you've only got one, two kits, five kits, you probably won't have that issue. So you can just let it download all in one. And then, uh, genealogy to do. And then I call it Match Manager Export Ancestry. Uh, and the reason why I like these names all to be the same, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll get to that later. It, it just saves you time if you just update these files rather than always having new files. Um, so, and I'll get to that, why. But anyway, you got your match files. And then basically, uh, like I said, you put them in, there's for me, there's my mom. My brother, well, this brother hasn't tested, but my sisters have. Nieces, cousins. Okay, and then you start with a uh, common ancestor. Let's go up to John Clarence. Because these are always descendants charts. You start with the common ancestor. Go to the DNA matrix here. You can select the facts, the layout. I always like the spouse down below. Don't worry about the page size. Uh, color, you know, you can do it by generation, lineage, X chromosome. I just generally like to have it do that. Then the DNA matrix, you have to tell it, okay, display the DNA matrix. And then here's where you add the files. So I'll go into my heirloom and then I can just select all my, uh, I'll just stick with one company for it right now, Ancestry. So here's all of them. And now all of these people are not even in this tree. Uh, like Anne, that's a sister-in-law. Brad, that's my, that's my uncle Brad. That's my aunt's husband. Uh, but it's better to have them and not need them than going back. And here's why I like to keep the same names because now if I, it, it was very quick to add them, but if I wanted to remove them, you know, it's like I literally have to remove them one at a time. And it's kind of a pain in the butt. So that's why it's like keeping the names consistent helps. Um, Anyway, then I have it displayed just the kits with the DNA and then you hit preview. Always preview first, don't go to publish right away. So the first thing it did is it went through and tried to find everyone with the DNA kit fact and now it's loading up the match files and it's comparing. And then so here we go, this is just my family. Uh, and here, when parent and child tests, they tend to overlap. So here's why you can you can slide them over. And so that's the DNA matrix right there. And then this page size, this will shrink the page or or increase the page size, so it's all one page. And that's why I said don't worry about the page size. But when you do uh, when you do do this, it's important. Uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't have that option checked. Show probability, because this gets into um, yeah. So, so there's no red. There's no red here. And that's important when it comes to the DNA simulator because th this is basically saying everything makes sense here. Um, if I did one with some red here, I'll do some. I got to do some straightening out and I'm actually thinking these are outliers. But 
Yeah, there's a lot more people. Because this is the side of my grandma where she was the oldest of 11 kids. And there's a lot of matches on this one. Oops. And see, so here, see, we got some where they're saying, okay, this is not a valid value for a grandnephew. Um, if you're familiar with DNA Painter and their tool there, this is one of the best sites, the shared CM tool. Um, let me look at that. That was 353. Oh, yeah, so grandnephew is technically possible, but it's it's next to impossible, so they're saying. Um, so anyway, I have to work on this. Now, there's some stuff where it might be... Uh, and for... Grand niece, nephew. Yeah, see, it's right on the very low end at 343. Oh, yeah, I guess that would be well. So, with, uh, with these with the red, I cannot use a DNA simulator with this because no scenario will become valid because I've already got this red. Uh, so ba basically on this line, I basically cannot use the simulator, not at least without, I'd either have to manually tweak these values or remove this match. And like ba basically any red match, you know. So, that's just something to be aware of. Um, okay, are there any questions on this part? Does, that, does everyone understand how, well, how, what this chart is actually telling you? Because see, like here, say if you take uh, this Amanda, trace it down over to like Chenny here Okay, she's, they're a third cousin. They share 14 centimorgans. Uh, this Chenny here shares, well, with her dad, 3466. Just kind of goes over. Uh, Amanda shares with Robin up here. Uh, Amanda and Chenny are third cousins, so their mom, their second cousin once removed. So she shares this much with this other third cousin, Melanie, that's Chenny's half sister. She shares 24 centimorgans. Um, and then she shares 493 up here with Evelyn, my aunt Tiny, well, grand aunt. So that, that's what, that's how you read this chart. Um, So are there any questions on this part in generating it? I'm good, you did great. Okay. Yeah, um, co common errors you may see is like, um, if, you don't, if you don't specify enough generations, like I, I typically say generations, but see if I'd say hit a two generations. Well, this is only going to go down to like this. Um, it's probably only going to go, whoops, down to about here. Well, there's, other than Evelyn, there's no other test takers at two generations. Well, no, my mom. It would only show my mom and my great aunt tiny, you know, so it's like you just want to make sure you cover enough generations.
so John, what do you have to say about the the kiddos that are matching it? I don't know what was it, three hundred cinnamorgans, whatever it was. That was you know a zero probability. What do you have to say about that? I say they're matching on two sides. There, yeah, there is a possibility because it's um, because there is some endogamy. Um, I mean, there's one thing. Okay, yeah, the, uh, the, the ones, Tara, let me just add in a couple more because it's, uh, this is on the MyHeritage side. Let me add Sarah and Tabitha. Because these two are first cousins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's Sarah and Tabitha. Yeah. I'm second cousins with their fathers. Okay. So their fathers are brothers, but their mothers, this Rose and Cheryl, they're half sisters. Uh -huh. so, they're, so they're almost double cousins. Right, exactly. Um, as a matter of fact, Sarah here matches Rose, you know. Yeah. Uh, because, well, she's technically a half niece, but the way this is displayed, that doesn't work. So, yep. um, and in a future update, that is something Pierre said he is working on is when people are related in multiple ways. Yeah, because uh, that causes trouble. Yeah. Yeah, the, there is something if you've got like deep endogamy, you know, like, uh, you know, like the Acadias or, you know, well, that's part of the French Canada or sometimes if you got like deep, like Tennessee roots or something like that, because yeah. I know my sister-in-law does. Uh, yeah, I have I, up my line, I have my grandma is almost also my aunt somewhere up the line. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you can do an overall endogamy adjustment, you know, like if you say put that at two, it's going to basically cut all the values in half, you know, right. so it might be you might try a 1.25, but for everybody in the tree, though. Well, yeah, see, that's going to do it for everyone. So I'd only yeah. use it if you're on a specific line that has a lot of endogamy. And, and that's okay. something you're going to have to like we can play with. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that's where it's like, okay, I know everything's right, but everything's coming up red. And um, so, so you do have some control over it. So, okay. Um, well, for my great grandfather, he and his sister married a brother and sister. So I would want to do something like that when I'm looking at that family line. No, because oh, sorry. Well, well, possibly it, it it only if you start getting red and stuff. Um, but because, John, if brother and sister marry brother and sister, technically DNA says they're yeah. all siblings. Yeah, well, all they'd be. So all of their children will be have have the same DNA. The brother and sisters marry brother and sisters. Well, 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 their kids would be technically called double cousins. Right. right. So and and, that, and I do actually have that because you see, um, Alice Maydine and Mildred married. Mm -hmm. Harold, Edward, and Paul Tunks, and these three are brothers. Yep. So these are all technically, so Phyllis, Sylvia, Diane, Deborah, Ter Teresa, these are all double cousins. So this is part of, you know, probably what's causing that, that value right there. Yep. So, and then, well, yeah, see, this is all in the same line, so that's probably what's causing these two, so. Yeah. So, but 
I can't do the endogamy on this because yes, it could maybe help with these, but then it's going to throw all of these off the off. rest. Yeah. So it's so yeah. So if if, if there was something where I was going to be doing, I would have to like, I'd probably either just remove these matches all together manually from the match file or I would tweak them. So, okay, maybe this one should be a little lower or a little higher, you know, right. depending. So, okay, now we'll go over onto the DNA simulator. Uh, now, I'm going to go to This is my aunt, my uncle's wife, and her and through DNA we found out who her dad was. I mean, this William he was born as Amelinsky, but he changed his name to Watson. Um, but now I found a match of four matches. Um, And let me just switch switch this. I found like a group of four matches and they all matched each other. And I emailed them and I got some responses because here this uh, Sharon, Mona, Sharon, Mona, Cheryl, and Kathy, and they all matched each other. And I, I emailed them and asked, said, hey, do you know how you're related to each other? Because all I had is how my aunt matches them. I didn't have any other data. And for one-to-one, -one, the DNA simulator doesn't work that well because, you know, if you've got a match of say 353, well, it could be any one of these relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's, and this one I think was even a little bit higher, but, um, you know, so it's like, okay, well, you could start playing around by yourself to see where it is. But since I found, um, they, they emailed me back and they said, okay, well, Shara, Sharon and Mona are sisters, half sisters. They share a common father, this Peter. Then Cheryl is Mona's daughter and Kathy is Sharon's daughter. So it's like, okay, so I know how these four are related. Now, if you look on here, it says no direct relationship found here. So this is what's kind of called a floating tree within my own tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and likewise for Mona, here's her DNA info. This is how I answer. Cheryl, Kathy, and Sharon, you know, so this DNA is all in there. Now, I'm not going to try to place Mona or Cheryl or, Sh or Sharon or Kathy because then it will just if I tell it to match Sharon, I can only use the match data between my aunt and then Sharon and Kathy. If I say just try to play Kathy, then all I can use is this match data between my aunt and Kathy. Same thing for Mona and Cheryl. So what I'm gonna try and do is match their father, Peter. Um, and I could re, re do some more research uh, in order to see like where these surnames might match up with Zamolinsky. But um, for right now, it's like, okay, I'm gonna try to place Peter in this tree. So I gotta start with, let me switch back here. And I know what's on this line. And so it's like, it, it could either be so I'm going to say, okay, I think Fred might be the common ancestor. So I start up charting companion. And the DNA matrix still has to be selected, but now I'll go to the DNA simulator. So here's some defaults things for minimum parent age, maximum, uh, 
in this max generations, this is important because uh, you got to make sure you go down enough generations to get everyone. Uh, and then tell it to insert people because this will insert, you know, possible spouses, siblings, stuff like that. Here's the directory where I save it and the chart name, just DNA simulation. And then I browse to um, the person and I select uh, Malian. Um, oh, how was that spelled? No, mail in, yeah. Yeah, so Peter, so I select him and then I don't hit preview. I say, okay, let's perform the simulation. So it's going through and now it's starting to run the simulations. Um, sometimes waits on the first one for a while. And now here it's going through all these possible permutations of where these people can go through. So it's going, going. So it's just going through every possible position for how these people might fit into your tree. Okay, now I'm going to just scroll all the way to the end without really looking at these just yet because here it says down here at the bottom, 66 scenarios. Okay, that's a lot of scenarios. Well, let's start looking at some of these. Um, okay, so here's my Aunt Jan. Okay, this is her son, check. Okay, so now they're saying, oh, Peter might be a grandson of Chick. Well, Peter's daughter, Mona, was born in 1924. Chick was born in 1957. So, well, that's obviously not right, you know, and then it goes on and on. Well, see, part of this is because I didn't have a birth date for Peter. So let's go back to the tree here. And let's just say, okay, well, Mona was born in 1924. Sharon was born in 1940. So let's just say, okay, he was probably born, say, about 1900. I mean, I don't know for sure, but that would be a reasonable guess. It might be 1905, uh, you know, but this should be pretty close to about when he was born. Um, so let's go back to Fred here. And now let's run in the simulation again. Okay, so everything's still set up the same way. So all I gotta do is hit perform simulation again. Okay, now it said, okay, zero scenarios. Okay, so now there's zero scenarios in which this could happen. So, well, let's go back to the tree. Okay, so maybe it's not a descendant of Fred and Pauline. So maybe it's from one of their siblings. Now, uh, so I'm gonna put in a fictitious person. And I'm gonna say Z Zemlinski or Murkek because this could actually be a sibling of either Fred or Pauline. It could be either one, but um, I'll just stick it to there, you know, because it doesn't matter if I'd put it here or down here. Just some unknown wife. Um, and so I'll run the simulation from here. Okay, uh, tools, plugins. And if you notice, I always have to shut down Charting Companion to make a change in my tree because while Charting Companion is open, you can't do anything in the tree. So in case you were wondering.
that's a little agitating, I find. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll run this simulation now again. Okay. Now I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. And and oh, I don't think I think I hit preview instead of perform simulation. Yep, that's why I did. I hit preview and not simulation. Okay, so now we're down to six scenarios. Okay, this is a lot more manageable. Okay, so now we'll look at it. Okay, so here they did this inserted person here. So basically they're saying it could be a, a sibling of Fred and we also know it could also be a sibling of Pauline, one of those two. So Peter is the nephew of Fred. Um, and then on there, and then, so uh, they'd be like, so Mona and Sharon would be a second cousin with Jan, and Cheryl and Kathy would be a second cousin once removed. Now here, okay, they inserted two people here, so Peter could be the grandson or great nephew of Fred. And now, no, Fred was born in 84, Peter 1900. Well, you never know. That that might be possible. Because, I mean, even though it's over here, this person could have been, I mean, for all I know, Fred was the youngest child of the family. He might have been the oldest. At this point, I do not know. Um, so that's a possibility. And then here, okay, he's the great-grandson. Okay, this one's maybe a little bit less po possible. Okay, now they're going to, okay, Peter is a half sibling to Fred. So uh, Mona and Sharon would be a half first cousin once removed. Cheryl and Kathy could be her half second cousins. And then likewise, it's still in the half sibling where ba basically Peter's a half nephew and on and on. So. So basically we got kind of two basic scenarios where, where he's either the nephew or grandnephew of Fred or he's a half sibling or a half nephew, basically. At least now you'd know where to concentrate on to try to match up their lines. And it could also, uh, help you know to find out okay should, where, where can I look for some more possible DNA matches well here's people in my tree it's like if this Terrence would ever have contacted me I've tried a couple times I've received nothing if I could find out how Terrence matches these four because I know he does uh, that might eliminate a possibility or two same thing with this Bill, her half brother, or this Tesla, Shailene, you know, if I could have some other match data. Or likewise, if Fred or Pauline, if they've got siblings and their descendants, uh, and if I could find out how they match these four, then that can help narrow down possibilities. So, that's how this DNA simulator, oh, and then uh, you'll see like these numbers like DNA simulation 287, 288, 289, 292. What those numbers mean is, is say, say you're um, working with Mona and Sharon to try to figure out. And if you'd wanna send some of these, um, because it goes into, I had it go into my documents directory. 
So here's this HTML file, this DNA simulation. That's basically what this opened up, this DNA simulation. And then here are the six scenarios. So here's like the 287. So I could just email this photo to him, this picture, and say, well, how does this look? Or, you know, maybe if we can concentrate working, you know. So that's where, so you can save these. And if you do do other simulations, and if you want to save them, save them from here. You know, create a directory and save them. Because as soon as you run another simulate simulation, because um, here, let me go back to Fred and run the sim simulation again. In which there's no scenarios. Well, now say my documents directory, those files are gone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you want to save them, save them. Okay. Um, e either that, or when you do do this simulation, keep changing the name, but but you'd almost have to change the directory too because. Right. You know, so so I find it's like. Keep the name the same, and I mean, you don't have to call it DNA simulation. That's just what I did. Um, but then create a directory and move them out of there if you want to save them. So Okay, got it. So, because otherwise, it'll get overwritten, and then you have to rerun it. You like have I said, to try the, to remember what you did first. Yeah. <laughs> the, the nice thing when you get out is it, it remembers all these settings. So, yeah. Um, and uh, and like I said, if I was doing this, say, on, on the hall side where I did have some of those red things, no matter what scenarios I do here, because there's already red in that chair, every scenario will always fail every time. Okay. So, so that's why you can't have any red in the initial. Uh, and like I said, so, so with my first chart, uh, I don't remember if I did do it. You have to do an initial preview first. You know, just to make sure, yeah, I did do it before. Just, just to make sure that there is no red. So, So, um, so are there any questions on this? Because I mean, this is, uh, you gotta get that DNA matrix down first, but then uh, once you do, it's like the, uh, oh, let me go back to, you have to add the, Try to build out their tree as much as you can, because like I said, with the Sharon, and, uh, as much as you can, uh, when you do the simulator, um, and you have to start the chart from who you believe is the common ancestor, even if you have to make up someone. And like I said, if you didn't want to put a name, you could just Put in a placeholder, you know, like that, you know. Um, but I just did that, you know, because this could be, like I said, it could be Fred or Parlene's parent. So, yeah, and th it, that's the other. Th so, and when you, when I initially added them, um, because I typically just went, did say, okay, add unrelated. I started with that Peter Malliant, uh, and then just went from there. Um, and then, okay, I know. I know Pearl was Mona's, and you know, and then I know she, she's got some siblings as her husband. And then uh, 
Then Peter met someone. I, I don't know who the Sharon's mother is. So and I know she married a Willen because that's Kathy's name. So. So it's like I just built him out. And then, like I said, I, then I know, OK, they got a number of siblings. Or Peter, I know, has got a number of siblings and stuff. So but just build out with what you know. And then uh, I'd even put Manly Inch in here just to think if uh, if I might have to go up further, you know, to place. But uh, well, actually, in this it didn't turn out. I had to add those two. So, but but these are completely, as you see, no direct relationship. There is a floating tree within my tree. This is all that's. Oh, they're all connected, so. So that's in like a nutshell. And like I said, you can uh, take a look at uh, on the YouTube channel that's in the announcements and the guide section. Uh, so, I mean, that's where this video will be posted later tonight. And then, uh, like I said, they, there are more detailed things on the simulator and especially the DNA matrix and how to download all your match data. Um, like I said, for Ancestry, I like doing that DNA match manager. There is, there is another tool that still does work and that's the DNA JEDCOM client. Uh, and that will work on Windows and Mac. Uh, but that is a paid one where it's costs like $5 a month or $50 a year. Um, but it still works. So, um, and I will sometimes use that on uh, some sites like for my heritage or GEDmatch if I want to get the, um, well, not so much GEDmatch. My heritage, I'll use it on or I can get the, you know, how all my matches match my other matches. It takes a long time to run. I think I did it for one of my kits and I mean, it literally ran overnight. I mean, it was probably 12, 14 hours just for one kit. So, I mean, so if I had to do that on all my kits that are on my heritage, I mean, it'd take me a month just to do them all. So, but that, that's nice. I mean, that's the one downside to Ancestry. They've got the largest database and I like their tools, but you actually have to contact them or get viewer access to their DNA days to see how they match your other matches. Where all the other sites, you can find that information out for yourself, so. So, um, or um, any questions? So, well, if not, like I said, it just takes practice um, and definitely concentrate on the DNA matrix first. Get that down. And then, like I said, the, the simulator is just one small step beyond, so. The hardest part is just getting the initial DNA matrix chart for all your known matches, so. And then, yeah, so, well, if you've got any questions, you know, I'm around on the user groups and there's other users there too, so. And uh, you can always, uh, and then there's always progeny support too, you know, and there's sometimes there may be some weird bugs and say, well, okay, you've got to go there. But otherwise we can normally figure out how to do things. So, and if need be, if you've got something specific, uh, you can also, uh, you know, just message me directly, you know, so if you want to 
show us something, but you don't want the whole world to see it, so to speak. Um, oh, I should show you one other neat, neat thing for sharing. Um, let me go back to, because some, something perfect for sharing is it does have an option. So if you would want to post it in the group, they do have this anonymize. So if you hit anonymize, they, um, this shouldn't take too long. You know, basically here, all it will do is, is initials. So this is, um, so, so that's, you know, something kind of more friendly and, and you don't even have to display the years. Years do help, um, especially the birth years. Usually when I'm working on it, I, I just concentrate on the birth years and everything else doesn't matter. And this is, uh, genealogy. This is probably one of my biggest charts I've done. And this I actually did help have to work with the DNA simulator on it. Because this line, well, this line right here, I got marked orange. Because this is like a specu speculative line. Because, and this is, I use the DNA simulator because here it's like I've got four people here and their mother. And then how they all matched, uh, you know, so here's, here I am, here's my sister, my mom, uh, my dad, here's my dad's first cousins, here's my aunt and uncle. And then there's a little group over here. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Susan Fossbender. She's done some talks at some genealogy shows that's usually dealing with uh, researching real estate, house histories and stuff. But I am a uh, fourth cousin with her husband, Gary Fossbender, and then their kids. But I use the DNA simulator to um, um, take in all their match data and how they matched so how these three people matched my here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kits here, and how they matched these five kits here, you know, and to come up with this. And they came up with like three scenarios where they could fit in. And then with some research, I found out uh, this is my third great grandfather, Adolf Fossbender. I know this Theodore Fossbender, this tree is accurate up to this Theodore. I do not know positively who his father is, but this Henry was, is the oldest child, I, oldest sibling I know of, of Adolf's. And he would have been, well, here, he was born 1801. So he would have been 19 when this Theodore was born. Um, so, I mean, I haven't found conclusively that Henry is Theodore's father, but I do know just from other stories that uh, Adolf is his uncle. And uh, this Theodore with this Peter Fossbender here are first cousins. That I do know for sure. So, so that kind of helped rule out. So I just don't know exactly which sibling. I haven't found any proof, but um, but yeah, this is like the anonymized, and so it's like if you want to. 
this is like I said, the biggest chart. And at Rouge Tech, I was talking to one lady and it's like, oh, she's got a chart that puts this one to shame. But anyway, so, but anyway, so that's one feature that anonymized. So if you do want to post it online, you can. And I definitely like this over like the Watto tool, the what are the odds tool at DNA Painter. It does kind of the same stuff, only you have to enter in the tree, you have to type in all the match data. And then if you have to change or something updates, then you have to, you know. And it's like here, it, it takes it all from your tree. You download the match files or you can manually create them too. And if you manually create them, then you can give whatever identifiers you want. You know, um, just just so that the identifiers in the match file match the identifiers in the tree, because that's how Chart and Companion can uh, match them up. So. Well, there's no other questions. Well, thank you for coming. We'll end it. And like I said, for a half hour to an hour, this recording will be up on YouTube so you can watch. So I don't have a question, but I do have one on there. We're trying to get Ancestry with the new feature where you can attach the DNA to the tree on, on Ancestry.com yeah. to actually make the DNA match with the, uh, with the, uh, match ID automatically generate on the tree itself. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. And unfortunately that won't uh, sync with your tree. So it's, that's just like an ancestry only feature. It would be nice if it would sync, you know, if it could put that identifier in for you. And because then I would, go whole hog and start matching everyone that way. But right now that, well, that's just more work. And I, I just as soon just label them in uh, the tree, but then you still have to match them, do something like uh, use the color coding of the stars, you know? So it's like, okay, I have recorded that person. So Otherwise you're going through and like sometimes all these surnames just start blending together and go through, try to track down, oh, who is that person? It's like, and then find out, oh, yeah, I added this match six months ago, you know? <laughs> so, well, okay. And like I said, if you guys got any questions as you start uh, doing this yourself, feel free to post them in the group, so. All right, thank you, John. Yep, you're welcome. Thank so. you very much. Yep. Thank you, bye-bye. Yep.